Tonight on Civic Education, we address the need for accountability and issue-based campaigns ahead of the 2023 elections. And controversy surrounds the delay of PDP campaign funding. This is Plus Politics. I am Mary Anna Paul. Every Nigerian wants issue-based politics, newspapers, editorials, and publish, you know, they editorialize and publish these columns and other opinion pieces on the subject, calling for issue-based campaigns ahead of 2023 election. Now, in more civilized or sophisticated democracies, this is hardly a problem. In those climes, political parties and candidates are sensitive and responsive to voters. They set great store on investigating the issues facing their countries and preferring solutions in their manifestos. The same cannot be said for Nigeria. These troubling realities make the forthcoming general elections a defining moment for the country, which in turn raises the need for a thorough and insightful search for who will preside over the affairs of the country after President Buhari, Buhari um, actually leaves office. Well, joining us to discuss this and more is Akin Braithwaite. He is uh, the governorship candidate of the National Rescue Movement in Lagos State. And also joining us um, via Zoom is Achike Chude. He is a public affairs analyst. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Mr. Chude, for joining us. Yes. Okay, I'm going to start with you because you're the one who's running for office. And like I said in my intro, um, Nigeria seems to still be um, far off when it comes to looking at issues during the campaign season. A few people do, but the large or the vast majority always engages in more of mudslinging. Nothing wrong with mudslinging because it's, you know, natural. It happens everywhere. But when it takes away from the focus of what that campaign should be, what the people should be talking about, then it becomes a problem. Why has Nigeria continuously taken on that, this course? We're continuing on that path of always majoring on the minor. Why? I think it has a lot to do with how we understand what a vote means. Um, I think we've all been fed on this idea that you just go there, you just put your thumb on a piece of paper and then you walk away and that's the end of the story. Um, my view really is that you, a vote is a statement of intent that you're coming to uh, decide um, on who you want to represent an issue that you have. Mm -hmm. So if, for example, you want to talk about raising taxes or lowering taxes, that's an issue. Um, if you feel that government should intervene more in the affairs uh, in society, then you would want to vote based on the issue of government or the representative saying, this is what we're going to do. If you don't like the idea of government uh, you know, really being front and center, and you want it to be more of laissez-faire, then you would vote for the candidature that's talking about uh, you know, less government involvement. However, um, the other important thing here to note is that we in Nigeria think that it all ends on voting day. Mm. But really and truly, if you do have an issue and a cause, then it goes beyond the day of voting because it only then starts because you now are supposed to be watching the representative after the voting day to determine is he really following the agenda that we collectively uh, decided that I voted him for or her for. Um, so I think if we do get to a point where we start to educate the voting public, that look, listen, a, vote, a wasted vote is that which you vote where you don't have a cause. And also, you know the person isn't going to do what you expect. That's a wasted vote. But a vote should be something that you are putting into the ballot. Regardless, Nigerians will say, oh, that party is not going to win. Therefore, I'm not going to vote. So that doesn't seem to have a purpose. But if you have a purpose, then you're looking for a party who is talking about pushing that purpose. And I think because in the past, political parties in opposition, those who don't win tend to go to sleep after the election is over. So people have come to the conclusion that, oh, 
oh, it's only about one day. Mm -hmm. And when that day is over, everybody goes to sleep. The guy who won, you know, carries on, does whatever he wants to do. The guys who voted for the others all go to sleep and wait for years. Mm -hmm. But we've got to let people know that that's not really the way mm -hmm. it works. It's a that's right. Uh, okay. For someone who works with civil society, um, I've had conversations with people who say, oh, we're not um, literate enough to understand how these things work and how it works in other climes. But every other, I mean, even the countries that we look to, I mean, the U.S. is having its midterm elections. Not everybody in the U.S. is educated, you know, formal education. So, but, but where does the place of illiteracy here come to play? Is it necessarily about going to school or schooling the people on their rights and responsibility and where does civil society come in here yeah well um if you're talking about uh, voter education i think um in a way it is a primary responsibility of the political parties uh to their politicians uh to educate the people um it is primarily their responsibility because they are the major losers you know, and the uh, gainers, if I use that expression, they have more to lose and they have more to gain when an election goes badly or when an election goes well. Because they are the ones that have, you know, expended their resources towards actualizing their political ambition. Mm -hmm. You know, they are the ones that um, have made all of the efforts, you know, in terms of uh, the campaigns and all the other things that are related to that to ensure that they can achieve victory at the, you know, at, at the electoral, at the polls, you know. And so when it goes badly, then you begin to quantify what has been lost. Maybe in monetary terms, for instance, you realize that a lot of money has been spent. And of course, we know that democracy or the presidential election in this country is expensive. People are, exp are, spending, the, are spending this money. Politicians are the ones doing much of the spending. Of course, you also have the, the kind of the expenditure that the that government makes also through you know financing the National Electoral Commission to ensure that they do their job and do their job properly and all that. So first of the primary responsibility of getting people to the to the to the voting centers are the political parties, you know, because that is the only way they can win. And so, but the only problem I think with the Nigerian situation really is the fact that. There, it is just like, and that is the essence of this discussion, that the politics in this country is not issue-based politics. And so if it is issue-based politics, then you are now going to, you know, uh, gather your people and mobilize your people on the basis, you know, of the programs that you have sold to them. You know, how, you, what, how you're going to intervene in their lives, how you're going to make their lives better, how you are going to keep them secure, you know, and so many other things that are related. Because... I mean, the constitution says the templates for the rest, you know, for the politicians, you know, to discharge their responsibility. When it says that the principal responsibility of the government, you know, is the welfare and the security of the people. So that is primary for every political party, you know, but in, an, in a situation where, you know, there's a lot of disconnect between the governed and those who govern, there's usually a lot of problem, you know, related you know, to the ability of the people to understand the responsibilities that they, that are owed them by the politicians. You know, and so that becomes, you know, a, a continuing responsibility. Of course, you also have uh, the National Orientation Agency, which is also set up for purposes such as this, to also educate the people, not in a partisan manner. Because what the politicians do when they're educating is to educate on the basis of, you know, partisanship. You know, but for the National Orientation Agency, it should be done on the basis of neutrality. And then same thing with the civil society, you know, organizations, people like us. And I think that we're very, you know, uh, for quite some time, we have been doing that. But I just want to say this, that it is not as if the people are completely ignorant of, their, of expectations from the politicians. Because you hear people, for instance, you know, in the buses, in the offices, in the market square, you know, you know, talking about showing disappointment and disenchantment with the politicians that they have put in power. Now, if they did not have any basis, you know, if they did not have any understanding of the expectations of the political class, then we can say confidently that they do not know that there are expectations. So they know that the expectations, they have not been able to tabulate these expectations. They have not been able to encapsulate them 
in a way that tells them maybe this, 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 this are the things that we that we require from them at all times. You know, so we need to do more to ensure that they are, you know, that that they, that they are uh, uh, more or more more politically conscious. And I think that that is what we need to do. Uh, it's not about education that comes from the four walls of a classroom, but it's about political consciousness. Them being aware that there's a relationship between them, you know, and you know, uh, and governance that they themselves constitute governance. That they are the people. Look, Yara Dua came when he came. He became president. He said that he, he that he is that he wants to be known as a servant leader. Every political leadership that came to power on the basis of the vote of the people you know, is a representative of the people and is a servant of the people. But unfortunately, because the political class has been, you know, hijacked by the politicians, by the money banks, who have also exploited the system, stolen so much from the system, and are now using it to write shot over, over the people, it becomes very difficult for the people to assert themselves, you know, and to adequately, you know, put themselves where they should be, on the driving seat of governance. Okay. Back to you, um... Mr. Braithwaite, it's the question that people always ask is because when I have these conversations, they say the onus is on political parties first, that responsibility to educate the people you want their vote. But that doesn't happen. So I wonder who gains and what do they gain from the people staying or remaining in their ignorance? Again, there is that narrative that um, the, there's a powerful force that is being used against the people. I was hoping that it would be something outlandish, but it's the people themselves that are used against the people. So at what point do we begin to see past these facades and break the glass ceiling? Um, you know, Eisenhower said that a political party, if it's not founded on pursuing rights and a cause that is moral and just, then that party is just there for a power grab. And I think to a large extent, um, from when we became a democracy again, it's largely been about the power grab, as opposed to it being about uh, wanting to create an environment and a society that really is for the benefit of the people. It's been more about uh, some guys who belong to a particular uh, group deciding to grab power. And having grabbed it, what we now see in Nigeria today is what I would call a plutocracy. And the plutocracy is something which is really uh, a situation where those who, are, who have a lot of money control the levers of power and the whole nation state. The people themselves, yes, are in a corner because they've been pushed into that corner by these guys who have the power. And to compound it has been the killing of local governance. Yeah. So the minute that you, you started seeing the drift and the trend away from local government uh, autonomy, as it were, then that was really the final nail in the coffin. So it's almost as if we have to rise from the dead, you know, and say, OK, this is where we are today. Um, like I keep saying to people, you can't go to Asso Rock and say you want to have tea with Mr. President. Um, you won't even get into the four walls of it. So the vast majority, 99.99% .99 of Nigerians, will never interface with Mr. President. And probably a smaller, uh, major, smaller majority won't interface with Mr. Governor. The real interface has to be at the local government level. Your councillor who lives on the same street as you, your local government, that's where the real power and accountability should happen. But because the powers that be have killed, in a sense, the local government, and people can't reach the existing yeah, powers. People be not being able to reach or not even interested, because there seems to be some non challenged attitude when it comes to... Well, no, no because everybody keeps saying, oh, the governor, the governor needs to do this. The governor, but then there are certain responsibilities that, you know, local governments, you know, have. But then do we realize it? Yeah, because we've, been, we've not been uh, made to become aware 
of the role of local government. Uh, a lot of us are not aware that local government is responsible for education, primary education, for primary health care, the most important basic thing. So that's like your first survival when you are, uh, when there's anything going on. Your primary health care is so important in the, in the scheme of things, right? Uh, waste. You know, all the stuff, your hygiene and all these issues are at the go local government level. The whole idea of roads, all the roads that crisscross your streets and whatever, that's local government uh, for you. So there are some things that we haven't really been aware of, and we need to make people aware of, you know, almost every day. And I can bet that once people become fully aware of their rights, as far as it relates to the local governance, um, I think that the game will change. Hmm. Um, Atike, I, I'm sorry, but I feel like I hear this all the time, over and over again, when we're about to have an election season. You know, we, we, the, all the good talking, the great ideas, we churn them out, but then it does not necessarily reflect in how we choose and pick our leaders, how we even vote, um, if we even watch those votes get counted. So. Are we really hitting the right notes here? Or, or like Mr. Bridgeworth said, is it that we wait when it's close to this time and start having these conversations as opposed to be having it all year round? And what are other people doing that we need to borrow a lift from, aside from the fact that we need to do voter education? That seems to sound like a broken record all, already. What is it that we're missing that we need to catch immediately. Because look at Kenya. We all watched the Kenyan elections play out. It was one of the most interesting things to watch on the continent. Why can we, as the big, can't we, rather, as a big brother that we call ourselves, uh, not be able to even scratch the surface of something that's being done in our backyard? I think there's perhaps sometimes we are, we are too hard. We are too hard on ourselves. And um, uh, we deserve to. Uh, but again, uh, don't forget that uh, if we're celebrating what happened in Kenya, um, it will not be out of the way to say that um, Africa celebrated what happened uh, in Nigeria in 2015, uh, because in an unprecedented manner, the government of the day organized an election which removed it from power. You know, and so uh, people saw that as a novelty in Nigeria. Uh, but it would appear that um, you know, some of the gains that we have made in the last 23 years of um, unbroken democracy, as they like to describe it, that we have lost in a way to some extent. Uh, but I, would, I also, I agree with you that, um, you know, we always seem to believe that, and I think I think was trying to capture that, that governance is a continuity. Uh, you know, election is just part of that process of uh, governance, especially in a democratic uh, dispensation. You know, and so when an election uh, um, uh, uh, takes place, it is just the combination of a period, you know, as specified by the constitution, where the leadership present themselves, for, you know, uh, to the scrutiny of the people. So it is at those mo it is at such moments that the people themselves are king, that they become kingmakers. You know, but then the issue is how well do we take advantage of that of that um, you know. A situation uh, in most cases not well not 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 very well because you know of the fact that you know we we, we are not adequately politically conscious mm -hmm. we do not realize that politics goes beyond the period before the election and the period of celebration after an election or lamentation after the election if people have lost now it is the beginning of another journey and so at every stage, we have to hold the people accountable. And, you know, I, I agree with you know, what Akin was trying to say about, you know, the local government, you know, uh, 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 councils. I think this is, uh, you know, an area that is very passionate, you know, uh, he's very passionate about. If we can get it right at that level, then we we'll begin to gradually, gradually, you know, push the frontiers. But, you know, the problem again is this that the political class in this country, and that's why, you know, I, I each time, and I, maybe I've used it on this um, program, uh, Kalmeya's description of Nigeria, of the Nigerian state, where he said that it is a criminally wrong corporation, where the leaders are, you know, are armed and are hidden in the safe. You know, because, you know, what do I mean by that? 
you realize that in Nigeria, when you want to talk about state capture, in a way you can talk about Nigeria as a, as a country that has been captured by the political class. Mm. So, and then if that is the case, then you're going to ask yourself, how come a political party is used as, the, as a vehicle for capturing you know, a state when the duties and responsibilities of political parties are clearly spelled out you know, in the laws of the land, in the constitution of the land? In that case, so if you look at it from that perspective and you look deeply at these political parties, you realize that they are not exactly political parties. Because if they are political act parties, they will act as political parties. Mm. If they are political parties, they will, they will act on the basis of, of, of their leanings, of their ideological leanings, you know. And, and on that basis, they will be able to map out a set of programs uh, for the people. So what it does, what it, what it now means, is that we are left with... Oh, um, I think we're having a little connection issues, uh, issue there with uh, Mr. Chudi. Mr. Chudi, can you hear me? For the full self and aggrandizement. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we lost you for a second, but go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah you know, so, yeah, so, so these are, are, are some of the critical issues that we are being confronted. Look at the issue of local government, for instance. If you look at the provisions of the constitution with regards to local government, it is constitutionally provided for. It is a third tier of government. And people will argue, or you know, one of the, if not the most important, because it is that government that is closest to the people. But what do you see? Over the years from 1999 to date, we have seen a continuous militarization of the political space in the country. And today I had cause to discuss with you on this program the issue of you know fundamental respect for the fundamental freedoms of uh, the citizens you know in nigeria press freedom and all of these other freedoms now you have a situation where if oh. people themselves are so much afraid of, of government and they will tell you when there's an issue for instance with government hello yeah so okay, i think i'm back so you, you realize, for instance, sometimes when people have issues with government, you know, and you want to take them off, take take it off with the government, they will tell you, no, how can you want to fight a government? How can you fight a government? A government would be... Okay, Mr. Chudy, Mr. Chudy you know, we're, having, we're having little connection issues with you. We're just going to try to fix that. But let me come back to Aki. He's making very interesting. He's hitting all the notes for mm -hmm, me. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to bring it to 2023. Every time I talk to people on how we're going about it, because it seems like we're back at where we were in 2015, where we're, everybody was saying, anybody else but this guy. Um, but then how do we avoid making that same mistake as to picking between a lesser demon because we just want some new lease of life as opposed to you know, changing so how do we avoid making that same mistake come 2023? I hear lots of people saying, oh, this election is a game changer. It's going to be a make or ma. We hear that all the time. How do we make sure that we don't make that same mistake? Yeah. Taking know, it from I mean, where a chick is, you know, stuck. Yes, um, I've had cause to think about this deeply as well, and it's really been troubling. That's why I decided to get involved uh, last year. Um, I think really when we uh, open it up and try and unpack it, it really goes down to the political party system. Our political party system is broken and we have to develop a new political class. Mm -hmm. That is people who don't have the kind of baggage that we've seen all of these years because it's almost as been like they've taken us for granted that it belongs really to them you know, as it were. And so they keep recycling themselves. And we think that, oh, we don't really have a choice in the matter. So you will hear people say, no, I can't vote for that small or new party because it's not going to win. Mm -hmm. So that defeatist approach is also something that is going to keep us in a corner if we don't sort of step, take a step back and say, look, listen, what is voting really about? What I was alluding to earlier that it is about finding a cause that matters to you, the individual. You are the most important stakeholder in an election period because you are trying to elect a proxy that is going to 
act on your behalf. And we have to really knock that into people. That look, what is going on here? Really yes, I say, we, is, yeah, we have to hammer it and keep doing it until people understand, oh, I get it, that the person that is going into that post is your elected representative who is going to do your bidding, what you want. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the social contract that has to occur between us and the politician and the political class. He is acting or she is acting on your behalf. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, at the end of the day, another scenario plays out, which is that perhaps the party that you, the issues that you voted for, mm -hmm. isn't the party that emerges as the uh, ruling party. But it doesn't negate your issue. Your issue is still your issue. And your representative still has a duty, is duty bound to continue to push your issue, mm -hmm. even outside of governance. Because political parties outside of governance, what we call opposition parties, have a role to play in the governance system. And their role is to play the legitimate opposition. A political party in opposition can even sponsor bills. A political party in opposition can push for the recall of an errant um, thing. A, a political party in opposition can take uh, an errant elected official to the EFCC. Mm. So there's a role, there's lots of things that a political party in opposition can do and should do. Mm. I wish that we had more time to have this conversation because uh, time is up. The guys are saying we have to go. But we have to be back to have this conversation. It has to continue as long as we can because, like you said, we need to hammer it into the, the minds of people because, again, we cannot have that defeatist mentality. Always a pleasure. Um, Achike Chude, unfortunately, we had a little connection issue. But, uh, Achike, thank you so much for being here and um, having this conversation with us. We will continue to have it, like I said. Uh, Akin Bertwe is, is the governorship candidate, thank National you. Rescue Movement, Lagos. And Achike Chude is a public affairs and it's a pleasure. Thank you very much, Marianne. All right. We'll take a quick break. And when we return, we'll be talking about the PDP mm -hmm. and some alleged controversy surrounding the campaign funding. Stay with us.